fourth watch starts now. Listening to the Fourth Watch with Justin Fall on the Fourth Watch Radio Network. I hope everyone's having a blessed week. Tonight is going to be a chilling investigation of different types of demonic attacks that seem to lurk in the shadows of night. And many of you listening have been victimized or may be a victim as you're hearing this broadcast. Not only you, but your children, friends, and family members may suffer as well. These various attacks have been recorded and documented across the world throughout history. While the science and medical world try to rationalize some of these phenomena, we'll be exploring the demonically charged characteristics, bringing to light the reality of these terrors, and bringing about some solutions. We've got a lot to cover, so let's go ahead and start the adventure. Submitted for the approval of the Fourth Watch Radio Network, I call this episode... Ridden by the Witch, Tears in the Night. Sweeping across the world, manifesting and taking hostages in the dead of night are many strange and demonic attacks on mankind. These attacks take place in the comfort of your own home, many times in your own bedroom. Tonight we investigate a variety of strange demonic phenomena that seem to leave people feeling helpless and in the grip of evil forces. We're dealing tonight with sleep paralysis, nightmares, and night terrors. Interestingly, in various cultures historically, there are specific types of demons that have been reported to be exclusively responsible for these different forms of spiritual attacks in the night. First, we see the incubus. The incubus is a male demon who seeks to have relations with women in their sleep in order to father children according to the lore. Some legends describe the incubus visits as a torturous experience, filling the mind with indescribable terror, similar to the modern day conditions of night terrors. Then we have the succubus, which is the female version of the incubus. The succubus is concerned with seducing men in their sleep. Nightmares coupled with nocturnal emissions fostered the belief in these seductive demons. Then we have the Mara, which is a demon that became the root word for nightmare. The etymology of the word nightmare refers to a night mara, or demon. The origins of the word are traced back to the 13th century. The mara, an evil female spirit, which would afflict sleepers with suffocation, was associated with a goblin or incubus who caused nightmares. The word appears to have become associated with bad dreams in the 19th century. Then there's the phobator demon. In Greek mythology, the Phobator, son of Hypnos, the god of sleep, is the god of nightmares. He walked in dreams, a nightmarish figure, visiting fear on those who deserved it. Then we see Epiales. Epiales is a demon spirit known for nightmares. The Epiales may have been a part of the Oinoroi dream spirits that were the children of Nyx, or the children of night. The Epiales means to lay upon people. But in almost every case of sleep paralysis, the victim feels as if an entity is laying on their chest, or laying on their side, or laying on their back, putting excruciating physical pressure on the victim. Now there are many others, but these seem to be the most common types of demons that have historical associations with attacks in the night or attacks while sleeping. Now I should probably start by telling you the background of why I began researching this. And I'm hoping you will take away some solid insight into these occurrences in tonight's show, which will help you better understand these strange attacks. It all started roughly two weeks ago, as I was finishing up preparing the Bible study segment for the show that I was to record the following day. I crawled into bed, and I turned on an episode of Next Chapter Radio with Mary Callie. Ironically, it was the episode with Russ Dizdar talking about the Satanic Chosen Ones. Russ explained that these chosen ones are set up with the task of demonically attacking Christians who have a high calling for ministry and great works for the kingdom. 
I started to feel sleepy and then a voice came to me and told me that I had better not record the Bible study that I had put together. The voice began to threaten me that I would offend people and lose listeners over it. The title of the Bible study, for those who might have missed it, was Are You an Antichrist? And it aired at the end of the Nephilim Conspiracy Volume 3. I then sharply rebuked the voice and it went away. A few minutes later it came back and began accusing me of putting together false doctrine in this study. And so once again, it was telling me that I had better not record and broadcast this message. So I rebuked it again and I commanded it to leave. And I declared that the teaching was solid and taken straight from the word of God. And that I was going to teach it regardless of what this demon said. At that time, the voice disappeared for good, or so I thought. I had gotten comfortable in bed and I began feeling like I was about to doze off once again. When all of a sudden, the radio show cut off abruptly at an odd place. This was strange because the show wasn't even halfway finished, but I was too tired to turn it back on. I then started feeling myself officially dozing off, when all of a sudden, I felt pulled down onto my bed and I couldn't move, and then a heavy weight sat on my chest. I was able to see myself and my room, but I couldn't move or talk. Instantly, I heard what sounded like a demonic symphony of horns blaring into my room from the doorway. The curtains by the doors were blowing as if a strong wind was pouring through them, and there was a dim light filling the door area. And folks, this was a totally dark room with no lights on. Then demonic screams and cries and voices began to accompany the horns and blowing. The voices were a blend of really high-pitched and really low-pitched voices, as if they were harmonizing together in an eerie unison. I now had extremely heavy pressure on my chest and my neck and I started to feel like I was going to black out. I tried to yell out and cast these entities out of my house, but nothing would come out of my mouth when I tried to yell. I began praying in my spirit immediately. Finally, after struggling for a while, I was able to force myself up into a sitting position, and I tried to yell out again, but nothing. I continued praying in my spirit and I laid back down, only to be pulled deeper into my bed, and I started struggling to breathe again. As I prayed, I finally felt as if a bright laser flashed across my body, and I jumped up into a sitting position again and could finally breathe. The only way I could describe it was as if my spirit had been pulled into an alternate dimension, where I was being tormented and attacked brutally. I yelled out rebuking the demons, and I laid back down in prayer. Almost instantly, I was pulled back into this demonic vortex and the heavy wind began blowing and the horns and voices began blaring again. I sat up and yelled for my brother, and as the words were coming out of my mouth, my voice went mute again. This time I looked over in the corner of my room and there were these little light orbs floating in the corner across the floor. They floated about a foot and a half off the ground, and they stayed there the entire time. I was thrown back down into a laying position and struggled to breathe again, and I couldn't move. There were now voices yelling things at me, but I couldn't understand what they were saying. I was finally able to fight my way back into a fully awake state where I was breathing and I could talk again. This went on for about an hour. Finally, I had the strength to yell out and command these things to leave my house in Jesus' name. And I told them that they had no legal right to be here. And I commanded them back to the place in which they came. I then prayed out loud and called upon God to send his angels to form a hedge of protection around my house. Then I felt a strange chill come over my body. I knew I was safe, but I felt pretty unusual. I was finally able to go to sleep for good, and I woke up the next morning still shaken by this whole experience. Now, I've experienced some strange demonic attacks in my life, including similar scenarios, but never like this. This not only terrified me, but was the most torrential and dramatic spiritual battle that I can ever recount. I started to do some research into this type of occurrence, and one thing led to another, and before I knew it, I was on the trail to another investigative radio show. Now, although I suffered sleep paralysis, this wasn't the only thing that took place, but I found that many cases of sleep paralysis consist of similar accounts. This seems to be a controversial area of research, because we have different views that are circulating, even among Christians, which causes many people to be confused on what exactly they're experiencing. 
Let's go ahead and look into the official medical view of sleep paralysis and then we'll dive into some pretty profound cases. First of all, doctors and scientists will try to coddle you into thinking that if you've ever experienced what I experienced, you can rest easy because they assure you that it's not a demonic encounter at all. As much as I'd like to wish these experiences on the doctors and their families for their disbelief, I can't. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, I wouldn't wish this on anyone. But let's hear how they try to explain it. According to doctors, why or how it happens isn't clear. Researchers believe that sleep paralysis is caused by a disturbed rapid eye movement because it mostly happens as people are falling into or coming out of REM sleep. During that stage, their brains normally paralyze their muscles anyway, so they don't act out their dreams. But during sleep paralysis, the sleeper is awake or half awake, which is why they're aware that they can't move. Studies show that between 25 and 50% of Americans have had sleep paralysis at least once. Sleep experts believe that sleep paralysis might be partly genetic. Other causes include stress and disrupted sleep schedules. Several studies have also found links between social anxiety or panic disorder and sleep paralysis. These geniuses go on to say that clearly an episode of sleep paralysis can be scary, which has led some to have unorthodox theories. Well, as unorthodox as it may sound to the medical world, I don't buy their claims for one cent. And as to the claims that it can be genetic, possibly, I know that many cases of generational demonic possession and oppression can shine some light on this theory. So it's definitely possible that there's a generational demonic oppression going on here, or even possession. But should we call it genetic? And the fact is, research shows that people in all countries around the world, we're talking China, East Africa, Mexico, Germany, all of Europe, the United States, I could go on, all these countries have long believed that sleep paralysis is caused by demons, witches, or other supernatural creatures who sit on the chest of the victims, and sometimes they try to have sex with them. Oftentimes, the experience is accompanied by strange and eerie noises, even buzzing sounds, sensations of being dragged out of bed or flying, difficulty breathing. In fact, some researchers believe that sleep paralysis is what's really going on with stories of alien abductions. So right off the bat, we can see connections to demonic activity. There's no other way to look at this. For centuries around the world, it has been a well-known fact that what we call sleep paralysis in modern terms is a demonic attack. Oftentimes, a male entity will attack women and sit on their chest, while often with men, they would be attacked by a female entity. While these scenarios aren't always applicable, they do tie back to the medieval tales of incubus and succubus demons. Popularly in Southern Americana folklore, it's also known as being ridden by the witch. It can affect both the possessed and the oppressed. Not all demonic oppression is brought on by sinful living. Let's make sure that we have this straightened out for anybody who's in doubt. As Christians, oppression comes in many shapes and sizes as part of our daily spiritual battles. Interestingly, I found out this little tidbit. Even the medical world has coined the nickname the demon in the bedroom in reference to sleep paralysis. So they deny the demonic realities of it all the while coining such a nickname. And from my research, sleep paralysis, while extremely terrifying, doesn't always involve physical manifestations. One woman even tells the story of becoming paralyzed and then hearing a whisper in her ear telling her, I just came to tell you good night. While that's definitely a light experience compared to most of the cases I've studied, it still terrified her. Many others report that they had a strong invisible presence hover over them or hover next to them while they laid in bed, and then it simply kissed them on the cheek good night. As a matter of fact, Mary Callie of Next Chapter Radio had this type of strange demonic good night kiss happen to her multiple times as a child and it freaked her out. Now, I want to get into a few cases that are on record. One victim wrote this. Before I learned to cope with it, I'd seen quite a few awful things. Horror films don't really do anything for me anymore because I've already seen the most terrifying things I possibly could in my own life. Here are a few things she reported. She said, I saw a little girl in the corner of my room and she was staring at me. Then without notice, she shrieks and runs up and starts choking me. 
Another time, a large dark figure, kind of a human-shaped silhouette, emerged from the foot of my bed and started staring down at me. Then something started banging and scraping on my bedroom door. I now keep it locked at night because I've had experiences where it opens by itself. My bedroom door opening by itself is followed then by dark figures coming into my room. She continued, the earliest one that she can remember is with her mother in the room and she's sitting on her bed and then all of a sudden her mother's face morphs into the face of a demon. There have been many others, she says. The worst thing is when you try to fight or call for help and you can't. Your voice doesn't work and your body won't respond. You lay there just feeling helpless. The next victim writes this. I have experienced sleep paralysis literally hundreds of times. To me, it's usually a slick, black, alien-type creature about four feet tall, although I've seen a Grim Reaper-type figure as well. Now, as I dug deeper in this research, I found it really interesting to hear about a husband and wife both being attacked in the same night. The wife reported this. The worst experience I had was with a devil-like creature. He was red and black with huge teeth and he sat on me. It felt like he was suffocating me. It just kept pushing on my chest and I was terrified. I couldn't move and I couldn't scream. What made it really bad was after I woke up, my husband woke up startled and told me something had been pressing on his chest trying to kill him in his sleep too. All in the same night. All in the same bed. Now, I'm going to cover one more victim's accounts of sleep paralysis, and he's got a few, and he's a Christian, and then we're going to move into the next area of research. He wrote this, I had my first experiences with sleep paralysis in 1996 when I was 16. I woke up in total paralysis and could see around my room. My room was exactly the same. The door creaked open and a dark figure entered. In this occurrence, I didn't have the choking or sitting on my chest. But then all of a sudden it transformed into an involuntary out-of-body experience where my spirit was floating uncontrollably above my bed. I could see my brother in his bed next to mine and I was trying to get back in my body. He says, I didn't have another experience until 2005 and I've had about 15 experiences since then. It usually happens to me just in the moment of falling asleep or shortly after. I feel the tingling rushing down my body from head to toe as one would feel when a muscle is going to sleep. At this point, I've had a variety of experiences, but I'll start with the most common, seeing one or two shadowy black figures standing at the end of my bed. They're staring at me, and upon seeing them, it is the worst terror imaginable. Sometimes they aren't there at first, and then the door creaks open slowly, and then they enter. One time they had on hoods, and their eyes were red and glowing. Another time, a bright light shone into my bedroom window, and I clearly saw the typical alien figure with the large round head and huge black eyes. Besides the intense fear, there is always the sense of an evil presence, even in the times when I don't see an entity. Many of the times, I'm being strangled and I feel a real pressure on my chest. There are also times when I interact with my wife and my kids in my bedroom, but when I finally get out of the sleep paralysis state, my entire family is sound asleep. One time I even heard my son calling for help in his bedroom, so I walked over there only to find his window open. And then I reached to close the window and a black cat with evil glowing eyes bit my hand. I couldn't shake the cat off my hand. At that moment, a hideous voice screamed audibly, we're gonna kill your children. Another time, the demonic figure with glowing eyes was at the side of my bed and it leaned over my head and pressed towards me to attack me. First, I just heard growling, and then he screamed his name in my ear three times. Darius, Darius, Darius. I could feel his hot breath in my ear. I have also been talking to my wife during sleep paralysis, and then she turns into a demonic figure that then attacks me. This type of occurrence is pretty common as well. He concludes by saying this, I have read extensive materials over the years and tons of theories, but have come up with my take with what sleep paralysis really is. Although I am an active Christian, I don't agree with what most Christians say about it. I believe what the Bible teaches about demons 
and that there is a spiritual dimension that is unseen to our human eyes. I totally agree with this guy. Now I want to sum up the sleep paralysis study before we move on to the next topic. It's clear that this is a demonic attack. They can range in degrees of severity, but there's nothing normal about it. We can accept an idea of our muscles getting paralyzed every once in a while when we're falling asleep. Okay, that's reasonable. But when we tie in the demonic entities and presences surrounding the victims, physically assaulting and touching and talking to them, threatening them, and the sometimes present demonic sounds and noises, I think it's pretty obvious that we're dealing with demonic attacks, sometimes pulling our spirit into full awareness in the demonic realms. But I want to move us into a pretty alarming area now. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the horror movies, The Nightmare on Elm Streets, but how many of you are aware that the filmmaker behind the movies got his ideas from a demonic reality? If you thought the Nightmare on Elm Street movies were scary, just wait until you hear the terrifying true story that it was based on. Before we get into the official story, let's hear what the filmmaker said in an interview. Wes Craven has revealed that he came up with the idea for A Nightmare on Elm Street after reading an LA Times article about a family that had survived the killing fields in Cambodia. They made it to the United States, but a young boy in the family still found himself haunted by terrible nightmares while he slept. He told his parents that he was afraid that if he slept, the thing chasing him would eventually get him, so he tried to stay awake for days at a time. When he finally fell asleep, his parents thought that the crisis was going to be over. Then they heard screams in the middle of the night. By the time they got to him, he was dead. He died in the middle of a nightmare, laying in his bed. Now Wes Craven also said this. He said, Here was a youngster having a vision of a horror that everyone older was denying. That became the central line of Nightmare on Elm Street the movie. While we know that Freddy Krueger was a made-up character and had nothing to do with the actual events, the actual events are more horrific than the movie could represent, and furthermore, there were multiple cases that were uncorroborated by the media, which showed up around the same time. It was a series of articles in the LA Times about men and boys from Southeast Asia who were from immigrant families and who had died in the middle of their nightmares, and the newspaper never correlated any of the stories. The papers never said, hey, we've had another story like this. But the third one that was written about was the son of a physician. He was about 21 years old. Everyone in his family told him repeatedly, you must go to sleep. You must go to sleep. And he said, no, you don't understand. I've had nightmares before, but this is different. He was then given sleeping pills and told to take them, and supposedly he did. But he stayed up. Something like six or seven days. Finally, he was watching television with the family. He finally fell asleep on the couch. And everyone in his family said, thank God, he's finally asleep. They literally carried him upstairs to his bed. He was completely exhausted. Everybody went to bed thinking it was all over. And then in the middle of the night, they heard screams and crashing. They ran into the room and by the time they got to him, he was dead. They had an autopsy performed, and there was no heart attack. He just had died for unexplained reasons. What's interesting about this phenomenon is that it's very popular in some East Asian regions, first seen in the Hmong immigrants in the late 70s. The Hmong people are a mountain-dwelling people inhabiting southern China and the northern parts of Vietnam, Laos, and Thailand. But when the immigrants came over to the U.S. in the late 70s, the United States began to see this phenomenon take place. The medical term for the condition is Sudden Unexplained Death Syndrome, a technical term which seems to be designed to make the scientific community sleep better at night. Scientists suggest that an irregular heartbeat might have something to do with it. However, there is no way to predict this syndrome in an individual. But as we saw in the previous story, the autopsy showed no sign of heart attack. And then we get to the Philippines. In the Philippines, it goes by the name Bengungat. And in Singapore, there's a reported 43 deaths per 100,000. The condition is rare, but it's also connected to folklore and myths surrounding a malignant spirit who sucks the life out of you. 
After a few reports in the United States, the CDC finally started monitoring the reports in the early 80s, and there were 117 reported deaths between 1981 and 1988. Why would this only affect certain Asian men and boys? I believe it goes back to particular principalities and demons that are culturally connected via false religion and practices. Now, many people are going to say, well, it's all a bad dream or it's just a nightmare. So to pay the due respect to the medical community, they actually have differentiated between sleep paralysis, nightmares, night terrors, and sudden unexplained death syndrome. How do they do that? That's a great question. Obviously, different attacks are more severe than others, but I still feel like it's all related to demonic paranormal attacks and experiences. Now, I want to move us into the phenomena known as night terrors, and I say phenomena because there's quite a few occurrences that get balled up into this category. A person suffering through a night terror may exhibit frightening behaviors. In the past, many people in various parts of the world have related these behaviors to demonic possession and oppression. This is really not a new connection, and it has a rich history. I remember as a teenager, one of the guys that I knew had a brother that suffered from night terrors. He said that the guy would appear to be wide awake in bed, and sometimes he would even walk around the house talking and screaming in total torment and fear. Sometimes he would even make his way out of the house and walk around terrorizing the neighborhood with his ghoulish screams, and occasionally he would even knock on people's doors. The ever popular way to deal with this, according to specialists, is simply not to try and wake the afflicted person up, but they say to either let them finish out their spell or try to gently walk them back to their bed. I think the strangest thing about this whole phenomena is the fact that the person seems to be wide awake with their eyes open. All the while, they're experiencing something out of this dimension. You can't talk to them or you can't get through to them without forcefully trying to shake them out of it, which doctors say can be dangerous. But even more mysterious is the fact that the next day, the afflicted person has absolutely no recollection of any of it. We can usually remember our vivid dreams, and we definitely remember episodes of sleep paralysis, but not with night terrors. Another interesting statistic is that the peak prevalence of night terrors takes place in children between the ages of 5 and 7. That's the age range where children begin to become aware of learning their right from wrong. Some people believe the age of accountability starts between 7 and 8. Now, I really want to turn up the heat for any skeptics listening right now. I'm sure there's going to be some folks listening who may be thinking this can all be medically explained. So I now want to move us and talk briefly about the Perrin family, who bought a farmhouse in the winter of 1970 in Harrisville, Rhode Island. The house was definitely a demonically charged location and has a dark history, but that's not the case we're building tonight. I'm actually in the process of working on getting Andrea Perrin to the fourth watch to tell her story in the near future, but I want to make the connections in regards to the so-called sleep paralysis and night terrors. First of all, when the haunting started, things were less drastic, starting with simple poltergeist manifestations who would just kiss the girls goodnight. This is one of the most popular occurrences we see with the mild cases of sleep paralysis in its introductory stage. Generally, the girls are just laying in bed and then here comes this shadow creature or this manifestation, bends over, kisses them on the cheek, tells them goodnight. We've heard it, we've seen it, it happens all the time. But as the hauntings got worse, one sister began seeing the shadow creatures opening her doors and lurking around her room and physically assaulting her while she laid in bed. Sometimes she would be grabbed by the feet and jerked out of bed. Other times she couldn't move at all. Night terror behavior began in one of the sisters. She would walk around in the middle of the night with her eyes wide open and she would freak out, screaming bloody murder at different times. Something was guiding her around the house. And this was the beginning of one of the most horrific hauntings I've ever researched. But I believe that in all cases of night terrors, there is a demonic presence guiding the victim around or tormenting that person in the demonic realm as they lay in their bed. And this ties right back to my stance on sleep paralysis. While some claim these experiences are merely hallucinations of the subconscious, this would mean that at some point, 
All the victims would have had to have seen something prior to that event, planting a seed of fear in their minds. But the issue that we're facing here is that these same demonic manifestations are appearing to all ages of people all over the world of all different types of backgrounds. This in and of itself discredits the idea of these being hallucinations of the subconscious. Just want to get that cleared up. Now, interestingly, in the case of the parents, it's believed that it was a demonic spirit of a particular historic witch that was causing most of the torment in their home, which wouldn't be a human spirit according to biblical view, but the spirit would have had to be the spirit that possessed this particular witch. Now, historically speaking, this doesn't sound like a stretch because for years upon years, the attacks that fall into the sleep paralysis category have been deemed as symptoms of being ridden by the witch. This actually makes sense when you think about it because we have these images of witches who straddle their legs over the broom and they ride their broomstick into the night. And so this same concept of having a witch or a demon straddling your chest, pressuring you on your bed to where you can't breathe and you can't move, it seems to make sense why they chose this term, ridden by the witch. We have several areas we have to clear up here before we end. Your home does not have to be on cursed land or even a known haunted location for these types of attacks to happen to you. The house that I live in has no demonic history. As a matter of fact, it's a newer home. There were no previous owners before the current ones. There has never been any witchcraft or occultism practiced in my home ever. But because of my ministry and all that I do, I was a victim. But at the same time, you may be suffering or your children or friends may be suffering because there have been portals or doorways opened in your home. If you're curious as to what types of things can open those doorways or portals, I recommend going back and listening to some of my previous shows. You can find one entitled Demonic Infestation and another one entitled Strange Occurrences. Or you could find the interview that I did with Josh Peck on the sharpening, which he's uploaded to YouTube. But there can be 101 different reasons for these types of attacks, and many Christians suffer from these. In the case of Christians suffering, it seems to be the enemy's way of trying to put fear into the believer and to torment the believer with all allotted force. And I'll admit it, when I was attacked, I was uncontrollably scared as I fought. I can't explain it beyond the fact that I was taken by unexpected forces, but God be praised, I finally got my voice back and I was able to rebuke and command the demons to leave in Jesus' name. Now on that note, I want to bring some encouragement to you by means of solutions. If you or anyone you know is struggling with this type of demonic attack, there are a few things you can do, and I want you to really consider what I'm about to say. First of all, Read your Bible and spend some time in prayer before you turn the lights off and go to sleep. Fill your heart and your mind with God's holy word. In your prayer before you go to sleep, ask that God would send holy angels to surround your home, protecting you and your family as you all sleep. I also recommend playing an audio Bible at a low volume while you fall asleep. This is not only proclaiming God's word in your home, but it's also filling your heart and your mind with the most powerful words and praises that ever existed. I recommend a free app called Bible.is. You can set a sleep timer on it so it won't play all night, or you can just let it roll freely. You also have to be firm in your faith so that if and when this strikes again, you're ready to rebuke these things and cast them out. Even while under paralysis, you can pray in your spirit boldly, just like I did. But if the attacks persist uncontrollably, and they might, many people struggle with this for years, you need to consider the following, fasting and praying. Some demons are so powerful, fasting and praying is the only way to deal with them, according to Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 17, verse 21. I also want to say this, and I know I say this somewhat regularly, but it's absolutely imperative that you examine your life. Are you allowing demonically charged entertainment or activities into your life? Are you bringing demonically charged things into your home? Are you fellowshipping with unfruitful and wicked people? 
are your kids? I want to take you to Ephesians chapter 5 verse 11 real quick. This passage commands us to have absolutely no fellowship whatsoever with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather we are to reprove them. A priceless asset to understanding spiritual warfare is the epistle written to the Ephesians, ladies and gentlemen, and this was written by the Apostle Paul, and I highly recommend getting familiar with it. Now finally, we must realize that it's not only the above-mentioned scenarios and actions that cause these things to happen. While I believe those to be the most prevalent, there are also the cases where satanic chosen ones will be commissioned to demonically attack the followers of Christ. Witches, warlocks, and all types of high-ranking and powerful occultists and Satanists make up this conspiratorial group, and I truly believe that this happens more than we realize all around the world. All the more reason that we must stay strong and committed in our faith in Jesus Christ. Studying and praying our Bibles over our lives, seeking a closer relationship with Jesus Christ Yeshua based on His terms that are found only in the Bible. Meditate on the Word of God and pray without ceasing, friends. Ephesians 6.12 tells us this, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's time to wake up and realize that the war is real. The battles and the attacks that we face every day, every night, they're real. They're not just coming after us physically, but they're coming after us spiritually. They're looking to attack us where it hurts. They're looking to put fear in our minds and fear in our hearts. They're looking to turn our faith away from God. I want to encourage everybody to take this information and pray about it. I know some of you are not going to agree with my stance on these things, but I believe when we line up all the dots and then we connect them, there seems to be some pretty telling evidence that what we're dealing with here is spiritual warfare. Now let's move into some edification in the Word of God. We're going to be embarking on a continued study of Nehemiah for a few weeks, and I want to go ahead and get started with an introduction to the study tonight. Nehemiah the prophet was known for being a really short guy. As a matter of fact, some people jokingly call him the Nehi prophet. <laughs> but this is going to be a relevant study of how God can use the most unexpected and even seemingly underqualified people for great works. This study is also going to encourage you by showing you how God's power can rebuild your life, how it can rebuild your relationships and circumstances, no matter how destroyed or how demolished you may feel. It was prophesied that total destruction would come to Jerusalem, which included the tribes of Judah and Israel. Not only would their land and temple be destroyed, but they would be taken into captivity for 70 years. I can't even imagine that. This was all because of the wickedness of their hearts, ladies and gentlemen. You see, the Jewish people had chased after false gods and idols and they had mocked the one true living God, Yahweh. And they had done this for so long, it just kept getting worse and worse, time and time again. It finally came to the time where they had to pay the piper. And they really deserved the cards that they were dealt. But at the same time, it was God's plan to raise them back up out of destructive states of punishment, and to reconcile them with Him, just as He does with you and I. And we're going to see just how God did this in the adventures of Nehemiah the prophet over the next few weeks. So back to the story. Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple, the city walls, and its entirety. The people were scattered abroad into captivity. As the 70 years was moving to an end, a man named Nehemiah, who was a Jewish captive, had risen to an honorable position as cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. At this time, Artaxerxes had been the king for 20 years. While holding his noble position in the king's palace, Nehemiah's brother, along with a few fellow Judeans, came to him. And this is the conversation that took place. Nehemiah said this, I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, 
The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Nehemiah chapter 1 verses 2 through 3. So immediately we gather from their report that the remnant of Jews were in great affliction and reproach. And on top of that, the once mighty strong wall of Jerusalem was totally demolished to pieces and the gates thereof had been burned. It was this magnificent wall that provided a safe haven for all of Jerusalem. This was a monumental part of Jerusalem and it was also a symbol of their strength and security. And now it was totally ruined and no longer usable. We can actually take Jerusalem as a symbol of our own lives here. I bet there are quite a few of you out there listening who fit this description. Broken and demolished. Who feel unusable. You may even feel forsaken to some degree. Some of you look back on your life and you realize that there are places where your walls of security and value have been broken down and burned. You feel like you have no more strength and ability to resist these attacks. You may have even fallen victim to sinful habits that you struggle to break with no success. If you really think about it, that's the exact kind of ruin that we see here in regards to the wall of Jerusalem. All hope had been lost. Maybe you've been influenced by the ways of the world and you've succumbed to cultural trends that are in opposition to the word of God. Maybe you've made habits of behaviors that the Bible says are wrong and you know deep down inside that they are wrong. But now, at this point in your life, you have a hard time stopping. You may have even begun these practices innocently. You didn't realize you were forming a sinful habit, but now you can't stop. Your defenses seem to have been destroyed and left in the rubble. But on the other hand, you might suffer from a lifetime of abuse and mistreatment. Maybe you come from a broken home where physical, verbal, and even emotional abuse have left you weathered over the years. Maybe bad relationships have left you scarred. So here you are. The walls of your city are broken down. And perhaps your gates have also been burned, just like Jerusalem. No one may know about your condition. To others, you might even appear to be successful and happy. They think you're doing just fine. But inwardly, you know that you're not. As you examine the walls and the gates of your life, you find that much of it is in ruins. So how do you handle that? That's a great question that many face. And that's why the scriptures are given to us. We can see historically how God has been faithful in restoring his children through the worst case scenarios. You see, God has the power and he desires to heal your heart and build you up in a strong and thriving relationship with him through the saving grace of Jesus Christ Yeshua. In this study, we'll be learning about how exactly God used Nehemiah to rebuild the foundational wall of Jerusalem and to restore the people. And the fact is, the wall and the gates get rebuilt. And you have the same opportunity, friends. I want to ask you this question as we close out tonight's broadcast. And really think about this. Are you ready and are you willing to allow God to expose your brokenness and lead you up the path of healing and usefulness? Everybody's going to say, yeah, of course. But when your brokenness gets exposed, it's going to resurrect some of that hurt, some of that pain you felt over the years. But I want to encourage you that you have to have these things revealed and you have to face them and you have to be willing to repent of certain feelings and sins in order to get into reconciliation. I want you just to take a moment and thank God for his power to reveal your weaknesses and show you your deepest needs for growth and repair. Ask him to reveal your own brokenness, not to condemn you, but to use it to rebuild your life from the rubble. I encourage you to submit and surrender everything to God, everything that is in ruins in your life. Ask him to rebuild you into the person he wants you to be as you grow each day in the knowledge and saving grace 
of Jesus Christ Yeshua. If you're listening right now and you haven't accepted the Lord Jesus Christ Yeshua as your personal Lord and Savior, and you haven't accepted His holy sacrifice on the cross to pay for your sins, it's absolutely impossible for you to have a solid understanding of His Word. It's impossible to find protection from the demonic realm and the days that are fast approaching, friends. And furthermore, it's impossible to have peace with Yahweh Elohim, the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ Yeshua. But here's the good news. You can start anew right now. You can repent of your sins and have the wages of your sins paid in full. Now is the time to repent and turn away from your sins and make right with the will of God. You see, the Bible declares that we don't know what tomorrow holds, so we must take action with the time that we have right now. Repentance is the first step. This means turning 180 degrees from your past thoughts, actions, and lifestyles that are in opposition to the Most High God. Because of Jesus Christ Yeshua and His once and for all sacrifice, you can be forgiven of your iniquity and every sin you've ever committed. Yahweh is a jealous God, but He's also rich in mercy, and tonight, if you're willing to admit your wrongs and repent, He's willing to show you that mercy right now, friends. The wages of our sin is death, but tonight we can receive the gift of God, which is eternal life. But as it says in Romans 6.23, only through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's no other way to come to God, folks. There's no other way to get salvation. You can't earn your salvation by good works. Fact is, Jesus Christ is the only way. Every other way, folks, leads to hell. There's no authentic way to the Father but Jesus Christ Yeshua. I'm so thankful that God sent His only begotten Son to die on the cross, a living sacrifice, and shed his sinless and perfect blood to pay the debt of our sins and the ability to be seen as blameless before God on that day of judgment. Let today be the beginning of your communion and peace with God as you're filled with the Holy Spirit and begin putting on the armor of God and growing into an intimate relationship with him. It's the will of God that you don't perish, but rather that you repent and enter into a relationship with him based on his terms. If you're not sure of what God's terms are, I want to challenge you to start reading your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, get one and learn firsthand what God expects from you. Christ is our only hope, friends, and my prayer is that you believe on Him tonight. That's the most important part of the show and by far the most important decision you will ever have to make in this life. Amen. It's been an interesting adventure tonight, and I hope you've all enjoyed this broadcast. If you ever miss a show or would like to go back and re-listen to an old one, every show is archived in high-quality streams on my website, fourthwatchradio.blogspot.com. That's the number 4, T-H-W-A-T-C-H-R-A-D-I-O dot B-L-O-G-S-P-O-T dot com. Fourthwatchradio.blogspot.com. There you'll find every broadcast dated and summarized for your convenience. Be sure to scroll all the way down on each page and click on the words Older Posts to be taken to more pages of archived shows. You can also find my shows broadcasted by the Fourth Watch Radio Network on Shoutcast, Spreaker, iTunes, or if you have an iPhone, iPad, or Android, you can download the Fourth Watch Radio Network app and enjoy easy streaming. For higher quality broadcasts, stay tuned in via fourthwatchradio.blogspot.com for all the latest shows. Like us on Facebook and feel free to add my personal page as well. If the Fourth Watch is ministered to you and you would like to help support this ministry, you can follow the link on our website. I bid you all a week filled with grace and peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll see you all next week. God bless and good night. You're listening to the Fourth Watch with Justin Fall on the Fourth Watch Radio Network.